we take some of the most well-researched scientists in the world and we make them perform or do art. The whole point of the show is to break down the barrier with our own bizarre mixture of dick jokes, puns, and puppetry. Um, <laughs> so for tonight's show, oh, I need my rope. For tonight's show, our theme is Wrap It Up, which is a... <laughs> I don't actually know how that slipped in there. Sorry about that, guys. That's not what the show's about. Uh, <laughs> the show is actually about all the cool stuff that's happened in science in 2015. Um, and honestly, I think this is the hardest topic we've given our performers to date. I mean, it's just so big, right? Like, there's a lot of reading about it, but if you, if you want to go through all everything, it's pretty thick. Just a lot of work. And like, doing stand-up set based off of science news, which is inherently unfunny, you are not guaranteed laughs, right? It's kind of a dangerous thing to do. Our performers have been working all month to come up with things, and they have not been practicing safe sets. <laughs> they have not. Those sets are not safe. Um, the, uh, they, they've, been, they've been doing stuff. They've been, they've been practicing at home and like practicing by yourself is good and it's healthy and it's important but it's just not the same. So they might have a little, little performance anxiety. So why don't we give them a hand so they, they can feel comfortable getting up. Yeah. Uh, but you know what, since it's on the tip of my head, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about condom news in 2015. I mean, we did the name our show, Wrap It Up. So, uh, it's been a big year for fans of Willy Wrapping. Condom acceptance is on the rise. Uh, condom supporters have been finally having their shouts and moans heard. The CDC gave U.S. schools a failing grade in sexual education, with only one fifth of middle schools and one half of high schools teaching sex ed that could actually prevent uh, infections. And for every age group, the least likely topic to be taught was how to obtain and use condoms. Uh, school districts responded by saying they know that they've been very, very bad. Is there anything they can do to increase their grades? <laughs> Bill Gates has dumped millions and millions of dollars once again into condom research, proving that not only do nerds get laid, they uh, advance the field while they're at it. <laughs> um, among those developed uh, from the funding uh, is the type of condom that even if it breaks could still prevent HIV, which is incredible. Uh, and these hydrogel condoms, which are very creatively named geldums, uh, they are apparently the most pleasurable condom ever created, and researchers know this because they brought in willing test subjects, they handed out a variety of condoms, they hooked them to an electroencephalogram machine, and they asked them to play with themselves while they watched the pleasure centers of their brain, which both started a whole new wave of college students who were willing to sign up for uh, scientific testing, and probably a whole new genre of ECG fetish porn. Um, speaking of porn, California has extended its new Measure B law, which, produce, uh, which forces any porn producers in uh, the Los Angeles County area to make their actors wear condoms. And it also requires uh, the producers to pay for actors vaccinations, testing, and medical exams related to STIs, which is awesome. The new extension would cover the entire state of California. You can clap for that if you want. I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, filmmakers claim that it's hard to keep their revenues up with all this pressure and are threatening to finish their work in California and find another hole in the market to fill. Uh, some condom-related news stories went viral this year. Uh, what do Ice Bucket, Cinnamon, and Kylie Jenner's lips have in common? with condoms, uh, it's that they've all become new challenges. So uh, the point of the condom challenge is to prove that condoms are incredibly stretchable. So sorry guys who say that they're too big to wear one. If the uh, California BBC Division of Porn has not proved you wrong, this challenge will. Um, uh, the, the whole point is you fill the condom with water, or with water, you hold it over the victim's face, and then you drop the condom on top of them, and it covers their entire head, which is kind of the exact opposite of safe and sexy. Um, but this is not the worst version. There's another version of the condom challenge where you put it in your nose and pull it out through your mouth. I don't know what this is trying to prove, other than that our generation is incredibly stupid. Speaking of incredibly stupid, this work of art is an actual type of condom that you can buy. The 
Donald Trump condom. Uh, manufacturers say that it is built like a wall to keep STDs and unwanted pregnancies out. <laughs> and it helps you negotiate rounding the bases of scoring safely. There's no way that I can top a Donald Trump condom. And honestly, I could, I could spend all night on condoms. But I think it's time for us to get the show started. Please welcome to the stage our first performer, Andrew Michael and Chris Ledford. Andrew Michael. And we are the, the Software X News Flash team. We got some, some heartbreaking science news for you guys. We'd like to start us off. This just in. I thought we'd be sitting behind a desk and nobody would see that I'm wearing jeans and tennis shoes. <laughs> This year, Indiana University published a study saying that watching cute cat videos is actually good for your health, uh, and I would like to know how much my girlfriend paid them to write that study. <laughs> uh, University of Texas discovered a gene that causes rodents to be promiscuous. The so-called DTF gene appears <laughs> in a third of all rodents, and uh, for some reason, they're all named Stacy. <laughs> A new study explained this year why dogs are such sloppy drinkers. Uh, turns out it's because they're fucking dogs. Uh, using forensic evidence, a medical artist has created a computer-generated image of what Jesus would probably have looked like. The image depicts him with dark skin, dark curly hair, giving us another fun thing to bring up around our right-wing relatives this Christmas. <laughs> This year, scientists in London gave a man the first ever bionic penis. Pretty fantastic. Uh, the man received an 8-inch penis that can become erect at the touch of a button. In other news, I'm opening up a savings account. <laughs> an AI has passed the college entrance exam with good enough grades to be accepted into university. Scientists are yet to discover which Bob Marley poster he picks for his dorm room. <laughs> Using radio telescopes at a much higher precision than ever before, researchers measured the energy output of 200,000 galaxies and found out that, uh, that, that they are only producing half the energy that they were two billion years ago, which means that that creepy goth kid in your high school is right, and in fact, the universe is dying a slow, slow death. <laughs> gene editing from home, uh, which I don't know what that means, but it sounds a lot more useful than most of the Indiegogo campaigns I've seen for some film school kid trying to make a skateboarding documentary. <laughs> I'd like everyone to check out my new skateboarding documentary coming out. <laughs> Uh, January of uh, this year, a synthetic biology company uh, used lasers to create and to edit DNA. Uh, hopefully we'll be using those same lasers to create and edit the face of Stone Mountain. <laughs> oh, shit. but supposedly none are their fault. That's the real sign of artificial intelligence, learning to pass the bucket on car accidents. Uh, scientists have discovered a black hole that is 12 billion times the size of our sun, or, or in layman's terms, it's uh, super fucking big. <laughs> Figure this stuff out. <laughs> I 
conducted a study using uh, algorithms and shit, and <laughs> I discovered that hip hop is in fact more influential than the Beatles, which means that if the Beatles are bigger than Jesus, then Jesus is bigger than Jesus. <laughs> That's for the older people in there. That's... I like that. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That, that joke was like the Velvet Underground. Not everyone got it, but if they did, they're gonna go home and start a band tonight. <laughs> that joke was like that joke, where like I didn't get it. That was... <laughs> The Kepler Space Telescope has found uh, what they're calling Earth's cousin, which is a planet that's similar in size, similar in orbit, and uh, orbits around a similar sized star. Uh, upon hearing about this cousin planet, uh, Earth immediately Googled the laws on the whole cousin thing in his galaxy. <laughs> talking about fucking the uh, other planet. That's what I was talking about. Oh, that's all you got? I got one more. I got one more here. I got one more. Let's see. Mm. Oh, NASA found evidence of water uh, on Mars this year. Uh, big deal. Call me when they find beer. All right, that's all I'm saying. That's, uh, that's the important news this year. So it was recently in India for my brother's wedding. Um, he married an Indian girl. We're not just like really into cultural appropriation in my family, uh, which is like what everyone seems to think when I tell them that. They go real quiet. <laughs> is she an Indian? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's okay. You can, you can approve. Uh, but we decided that if the self-driving car ever went to India, it would just go to the side of the road and park. And that would be the safest option. <laughs> um, okay, so up next is Benjamin Carr. He is a writer and storyteller around town. He is a regular at Naked City and Carapace. And he recently founded, I did not know this, a creepy, weird, lit journal, Gut Wrench, which is available at gutwrenchjournal.com. So check that out. I know I will be. There are a lot of asides in this piece. Please find me clever. <laughs> We're all liars, all of us, and that's a great unspoken truth, and I hope I'm not surprising or shocking you by saying that. Actually, that's a lie. I think it'd be funny if I surprised or shocked you with that right at the beginning of my piece. That's a good grabber, right? Everybody would remember that, and they'd think that I was talented, and maybe they'd compliment me afterward. God. I hope I can remember how to seem humble in the face of a compliment when, when nobody likes this. Nobody's gonna talk to me. I'm gonna die alone, <laughs> surrounded by Star Wars action figures. <laughs> but since this is solved for X, I'll cite my resources in a, bo in a boring passage that I hope nobody checks. Um, according to a 2002 study from the University of Massachusetts, on average, people tell two to three lies in a given 10 minute conversation. According to Psychology Today, whose website helped me find a therapist who takes my insurance, it's just an aspect of social behavior to lie. It's not our fault that it's our fault. It's, an ingra it's ingrained in how we behave. I do this on purpose. I'm not proud of lying, except when I am. So do you. So are you. Judge me if you want. Just remember me. We protect ourselves. We prop ourselves up. We brag. We boast. We daydream, we make ourselves the hero. We all have naked, honking desperation to be liked that we spend a lifetime trying to downplay, hide, and control. We exaggerate when our hearts feel too bare or worse, when our penises feel too small. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, emotionally sometimes, all of our penises feel too small. <laughs> This is a science show. Smile so that you know that women don't have penises. <laughs> also let them you know that this aside gimmick has been done at least three times already, which means you can stop doing it now. You've made your point. They get it. You're a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Change gears. Take a breath. Be confident. Like Brian Williams, like it's 2014 confident. <laughs> 
For those of you who do not recall, or cannot recall correctly, Brian Williams was the anchor of the NBC Nightly News, recalling an event during a broadcast from 2003, March 2003, when he was a reporter embedded with a military unit in Iraq. Williams claimed on air that he was aboard a Chinook helicopter that was forced down by a rocket-propelled grenade and that he and his unit were stuck in the Iraqi desert. It's an anecdote that he also shared on David Letterman and probably at cocktail parties. It's the kind of story that journalists dole out for years to their buddies. It's like a merit badge. Except it wasn't entirely true. Brian Williams was incorrect. And if you pull up the original broadcast from 2003, you can see Brian Williams contradict Brian Williams, saying that he, he, he tells what really happened. There were two Chinook helicopters traveling that day. One of them did get hit by an RPG and was forced down in Iraq. And Brian Williams was in the other one, behind it, <laughs> that arrived a half an hour later. <laughs> but over time, Brian Williams, in telling the narrative, changed it to himself and to others. He put himself in the action rather than outside it. And then he went on air and lied, probably accidentally but not maliciously. And the pilot of the affected helicopter was the person who tweeted to him. He said, dude, I, I don't remember you being there. <laughs> but then the same pilot later that week said that maybe he was? Dude, I I I'm, I'm really not sure. I don't know. Were you? Brian Williams says that his memory of events is foggy and that he got confused not because of head injuries that he incurred during the fake incident, <laughs> but because that's what happens to all of us regarding memory and ego and lies and how we tell stories. That's what happens when we witness something and a moment or a month or a year passes. Memory hits areas of the brain and they don't always find their way back along the same path. We move ourselves into the spotlight into center stage, sometimes removing context or subtext or outside noise or situations, because even though we're secondary characters in other people's lives, we are not secondary characters in our own. Tonight, right now, mm -hmm. I'm on stage under a spotlight. And tomorrow, if the whiskey does its effect, <laughs> I won't be able to remember any of this. <laughs> Four years from now, I wonder if this night occurred in the same night that I ended up in bed with the guy who smelled like cheese. <laughs> but <laughs> that thing that I wish that I had said will become that thing that I think that I said. And eventually, like cheese, all of these recollections will melt into one spectacularly incorrect but thoroughly compelling narrative with me at the center of it all about everything that happened just now. Where were you when JFK was shot? Where were you on 9-11? Were you really at Woodstock? <laughs> really? Really? Are, are, are you sure? How sure? I worked as a newspaper reporter from the time that I was 16 until the time that I was 24. You interview people, you get quotes, you try to your best to summarize what happened, knowing full well that you won't be able to get it entirely right. There's a phrase that we were taught in ethics class, journalism ethics class. Yes, it exists. It's <laughs> the phrase that we were taught was the appearance of objectivity, because the appearance of objectivity is all you can really ever hope for as a journalist. Because you're human, you have bias, you have opinions, you have the questions that you ask and why you ask them, and the questions that you avoid because the answers seem too obvious to you. And it all controls how the story gets reported, and what stories get reported, and the type of language that you use. But I'm not trying to be bleak and political right now, it's just how humans work. We are biased, self-centered, egomaniacal, lying individuals with unreliable narratives and brains that don't, and brains that don't fire the same way, or at all right now. <laughs> and now Brian Williams is literally without an anchor because of something that we all do all the time. You ever see that movie Rashomon? Three people in the movie all witnessed the same crime and then testify as to what they saw. They were all there. They were all involved to some degree, but they didn't all see the same thing. 
Yet everybody's there all telling the truth. Their truth. At Carapace, another live bit event around town where people get on stage where people get on stage without notes and just talk about their lives. The rule is stated at the beginning of the show. Stories don't have to be factual when you tell them, but they have to be true. One time I told a story about my mother, my stepdad, and oddly enough, a helicopter crash. <laughs> that they witnessed and landed on the news. I did impressions, I repeated what I remembered everybody saying. Somebody recorded it, and I played it for my mother, who loved it, and then told me what really happened. <laughs> because of the circumstances that I'd forgotten, the details that I'd left out, the stuff that made all the motivations clear and not crazy, the details that I'd omitted while trying to turn people into characters and made the event into a tale. I thought I was telling the truth. We mean well. We all just want to be interesting and loved. Please, please, if you can, love the version of me that I'm trying to sell you right now. <laughs> this version of myself that I'm trying to believe is real. We all do that. We all want that. Mark Twain once said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. At least some people think that he said that. <laughs> Others aren't sure and I don't remember. Thank you. totally at this very show have misquoted Mark Twain at least twice <laughs> because I've read things by him that I believed to be by him because they were clever. So for reals y'all, if finals have, and, and this show have taught me anything, it's that memory is incredibly fallible. Okay, so up next, we have something that we do very special on the show that is uh, something we're like, literally not allowed by the audience not to do, which is slideshow karaoke. Uh, what we do is we bring up improv comedians and we put them in front of an actual science presentation that has been given at some sort of conference uh, and we make them give expert testimony about what is behind them. They've never seen it before. It's a lot like Fox News. Um, please welcome to the stage my co-producer, Paige Bowman. Or 
or something. <laughs> it's a hot vacation spot. I hope one day to be taken there with a passport that I still do not have. Um, I don't know what, can we just go to the, all right. Uh, this is my mother, um, <laughs> Lynn, as we call her, famed biologist, former, why are we still defining women by the people they fucked? <laughs> moment, former mistake of Clint, what was his last name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, horizontally transferred genes, that's a bedroom thing I don't do. Um, the second genome is not welcome in the bedroom either. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I don't even want to deal with you. Oh man, a dog. Uh, I know technically I'm for equality, but I will fucking cat call a dog. I will absolutely call out the that one's kind of blurry, but uh, they just look like when I drink. So uh, this is um, a study. I I have a journalism degree oh, yes! and still do not understand citations. Well, this is just a human centipede if I've ever seen. <laughs> um, honestly, none of these dogs really do it for me. This is uh, I did better at Piedmont Park this weekend. This kid looks like me when I see kids. Um, <laughs> managing the human ecosystem for effective immune maturation and tolerance. I think that's when my boyfriend makes pancakes on Sunday. <laughs> and then I'm like, fine, we can do some stuff. Uh, I think, um, the brain, who's running the show? This bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Always and forever. Um, you know, we're not really far enough in our relationship to talk about that kind of stuff. Uh, this is just a nightmare. This looks like the articles men at my work submit for the newsletter. You have no idea what the topic is. And you're just, you know. Uh, ooh, I think this was uh, about pregnancy at some point. Is the microbiome the, the here place? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I went to a public school, they didn't have sex ed. Um, <laughs> I like this one though, that's a good, that's a good animation. Um, the proposed new environmental health assessment model, I think that's my annual at the gynecologist, I think that's what that is. Uh, she's assessing my health. The Tree of Life is a terrible movie, it's really bad. <laughs> no idea what happened. Uh, thank you guys so much for being so much. please welcome Fantastic. One more time for Paige. I'm sure that was at least 3% factual, which is about how much juice was in what I had for dinner. So we're, we're great. We're great. Up next is Olivia Cathcart. Olivia Cathcart is a comedian and a dog person. Uh, and living in Atlanta, Georgia, she writes for The Laugh, but I can't read Paige's handwriting. Button, The Laugh Button, which is adorable, and Creative Loafing, which I can read because I've read Creative Loafing a million times. Please welcome to stage, Olivia Cathcart. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it didn't say in the bio, but I am a feminist hero. So obviously, uh, tonight's topic is, you know, something that uh, was clearly something I had an expertise on. Um, men in power who are misogynists. Can you believe it? It happened again in 2015. <laughs> this year, a very famous scientist named Tim Hunt went to this luncheon. It was like an international luncheon where he got up and did a speech. And during the speech, he uh, started off a part where he said, you know what the problem with women in the lab is? Three things. So he's thought this out. Uh, use that term slightly. Um, one, you fall in love with them. Oh, almost a compliment. <laughs> Two, they fall in love with you. This is a 72 year old man saying this. <laughs> I think, is this kind of like when, like, in school someone thought you liked him just because you talked to him? It's like, no, I'm legally required to talk to you. We're in class together. <laughs> and three, when you criticize them, they cry. Hmm, this is really fun. My first thing is, like, whenever anybody starts a sentence by saying, you know what the problem with women is? I immediately just, I'm like, oh, you've never made anyone come. That's, <laughs> that's what I learned about you. Did I break this? Did you turn it off? No, I could have done many things. that a man had to come back. <laughs> fuck up with it. Shut the fuck up, everybody. It's fine. I'm like, is 
listen in. Uh, so yeah, Tim Hunt, uh, big misogynist, probably never made a woman come. He thinks that all women in his lab have all fall in love with them, and he criticizes them and they cry. Which, when you go on like a misogynist rant like that, like, I want to know, like, what does he mean by criticizing? Like, were you critiquing them for not having detailed enough notes or for not having a penis? Because that's what it sounds like. Or can they just not take, like, a criticism, or are they just so upset because you just sent them into, like, an existential black hole that they can't get out of? Because they're a woman scientist. They don't know shit, right? Science. Nature. That's what they know about. Um, this got word, like, someone tweeted out, like, everything that happened, and he got, uh, everyone got real mad at him. And he tried to defend himself in the interview by saying, um, I was just being honest. Which is my favorite thing. That anyone ever says. That's such a great way for people to like get off blame. Like that's how like dishonest society is, where like we view being honest like way too high. I don't understand how it gets you off where he was just like saying, No, 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 I think women are inferior to men and no no no, you don't get it. I really mean that. I really mean that. <laughs> so don't blog about me, it's fine, it's just we live in a society where being a liar is worse than being a bigot. That's so weird to me. Um, I don't know why women are a distraction in the workforce. I do say you don't get to, as a scientist, ever say that you're distracted. I think immediately you should be fired from your job. It's like you can't be squeamish and also be a doctor. That doesn't work. You can't be unfocused and be a fucking scientist. That doesn't get to work for you. Like, if you can somehow be off focus from, like, the possibility of, like, curing cancer, get the fuck out of the lab and leave your dick at the door because you are useless. You can do nothing for humanity. Get the fuck out of here. And for the record, uh, you don't get to say that. Like, the only woman who is a distraction from science is Jenny McCarthy. She's the only person you can say that about. <laughs> So unless there's like someone in the lab in like a bikini picking their nose talking about how they think that it's better for a generation of kids to die from easily preventable disease than to get autism, then yeah, you just keep keep your eye on the paper. Keep working, dude. You're fine. It's awful. Um, I don't know why it's... I think he, at least I have to give him credit for changing up the normal sexism towards women in the workforce. Because normally people are saying the problem with women scientists are not that they're distracting. Uh, but because they're just bad at it. They're not as good. Everyone always says that women are bad at science and math, and they always try to be like, why is that? I'm not saying it is, but why is that? And I don't know, but I want to assume it's only that case that maybe we're, you know, history-wise, we're bad at it. It's because until 1925, it was illegal for us to learn those subjects. Maybe that had something to do with it. You ever been, like, in recess, and you were, like, trying to do a foot race with someone, and the last second he grabs your shirt and pulls you back? That's the patriarchy. That's what that is. <laughs> like, you've got a head start of us, boo-boo. Please don't be mad at us. I don't know. I think... I, I think it's awful that women, you know, are distracting these men, um, to the point where Tim Hunt also said that he thinks the best thing to do is to have single-sex labs. Which is a very, like, fight fire with fire way of achieving progress. That's one step forward, 80,000 steps backwards. Yes. Just keep going until you get to 1901 Missouri. Um, I would like to think that if he is correct that women are distracting men, then here's probably why we don't have, like, just the long list of inventions I've been waiting to have. So these are all the things I'm assuming we don't have yet. Because... These old distracting ladies in their white lab coats that go past your knees are so distracting. <laughs> Things that we don't have. Um, jeans that don't give you a zipper boner when you sit down. <laughs> Why don't we have that yet? I feel like we should have done this already. But, you know, men get distracted. Um, mini marshmallows that don't uh, immediately melt when you hit anything liquid. That'd be great. Um, a beer that takes away calories and feelings about your father. Um, a strand of weed that doesn't smell like ass, because they all do. Uh, whatever chemical in the brain compels people to write on event pages that they won't be attending. There's a button for that. Why do you? Well, I don't know. Sign that person. Uh, an easy-to-use ice cream machine. 
tailor it to the contestants on Chop so they can finally start fucking that up on the last round of every episode? I don't know. That keeps on happening. We don't watch Food Network? Fine, whatever. <laughs> uh, the scientific reason why Tatiana Mazzoni has yet to earn an Emmy for Orphan Black because there's no good reason why that hasn't happened. Get on it, science. What the fuck is that about? Um, a portable breathalyzer that tells you if someone has ever sincerely drank a Mountain Dew Code Red? <laughs> don't let that person drive. Don't ever let that person drive. Don't be friends with that guy. Um, a DVR or like a cable box that filters out that one Folgers coffee commercial where it looks like the brother and sister are gonna fuck. <laughs> An app that can tell you if there's anybody near you who likes that Folgers commercial. That's another one. <laughs> Uh, something like similar to Yelp that just tells you like on average how many visors are going to be worn in a bar so you can know whether or not to go to that bar. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, a dog whistle but one that only members of a bachelorette party can hear. <laughs> now that sounds like I'm going anti-women. That's just pro-hospitality uh, and service workers and that's all genders. So it's really more inclusive. Um, a piece stick that you can buy at CVS that can tell you if you're barren or not. I would really like to have one of these. Are you there? Science is me. Fear. Um, and I think another one that would be really great would be the opposite of Viagra, and this would be specifically marketed to dogs who have been fixed and Tim Hunt, so they can get some shit done. Um, that's all for me. Thank you, guys. good thing that came out of all of the sexism and sciences here is like some really cool hashtags, which is like the shittiest consolation prize ever. Um, but if you look at girls with toys or I look like a physicist or I look like a professor, you can find some really cool like women being like, whatever, I don't care, I'm good. Um, speaking of a woman who's like, whatever, I don't care, I'm good, please welcome the stage to Arla Elitar. She's a award winning playwright and actor. She makes her home in Atlanta with her guy and her cat. Please welcome her to the stage. I'm going to take a little moment to set up here, so just bear with me for just a moment. Talk amongst yourselves. Make friends with your neighbor if you don't know them. Everything here is old enough to do it. 
had sound in space. Does everybody remember this? Right. Star Wars came out, had sound in space. Star Trek came out, had sound in space, right? And then I remember getting into high school and figuring out, Um, learning that there's no sound in space. And so when I got old enough and I would watch these movies, I would be that person watching a movie that's taking place in space and saying things like, that's not real. There's no sound in space. As if the sound in space is my line of suspending my disbelief. Like, I'll buy everything else except the sound in space. And now you've lost me. Right? And then Joss Whedon came out with Firefly.
simple human ears could take in and that our brain could convert into some sort of data so that we could have something to work with. I could listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson go on for hours about names. I could listen to him give me all the facts about space. I've heard him describe what it would be like to fall into a black hole piece by piece, literally piece by piece. And, and all I can do is tell you that I, I want to grasp what the universe is and I don't think it will ever happen. What space is, it will never happen. It's like trying to grasp the idea of God or gods or death. And I can barely grasp onto life. So this, really beyond my comprehension of reality. So I'll just listen to the recording that they gave us. I sometimes wonder, in listening to this and preparing for this, if these sounds that were recorded, if there are thoughts that get to vibrate in space, like whatever you're thinking right now, it has to go somewhere, it doesn't just stay inside you. And if that's what creates the sounds, not just the rush of us barreling through space, but our thoughts, our emotions, maybe the souls of people that we knew, rushing past one another, maybe that's how the universe continually grows because people are dying, and it creates the rest of the universe. It's a possibility. It's just one thought. It's almost as real as Star Trek. <laughs> There's a Doctor Who episode in the last season where he goes to the end of the universe, and it's not the way Douglas Adams pictured it at all. It's <laughs> just the end and the demise of all we know and we don't know, all the solar systems and planets and rocks and beings and stars and matters, light or dark, are going to be gone. And he speaks of the silence that is coming because of that. And he says, listen. And I think that he's right. There will only be absolute silence when all of it is gone. All of it. Thank you.
You know what I mean. <clears throat> now, as you can tell, once again, so, corn, this is real corn now, in case you haven't caught on, because you, as you can tell, it's bigger. Now, <clears throat> corn, of course, is 1.42% more corn than other corn. Now, this is very important for you to remember when you're doing agriculture, because once again, agriculture goes from top to bottom. If some corn is more than other, it's heavier. You don't want to get hit by falling corn. Uh, as you can tell, corn in genomes and fish analysis, uh, much like the mythic minotaur, live in vast labyrinths, populated by wandering Greeks and blue lines which go in circles, as you can tell. Now, in case, some tomatoes look like testicles. This is something we've been studying for a long time. Now, some tomatoes, as you can tell, do not look like testicles. We've been researching which tomatoes are more appealing to most people, and we've also noticed that, well, okay, you get the reference there, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, as you can tell, crop domestication is essentially an 80s video game. All right, there's a lot of like blinking squares, and you've got to fight through the wild species to domesticate your crops, because wild species will take your corn out, showing like all sorts of the world and things outside of the farm, and you're never gonna get it back home again. <clears throat> ah, as you can tell, germplasm, Family show. Germplasm banks! Of course, I'm just embarrassed to talk about that. Okay, th th thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, molecular tagging of downy mildew red. Ah, maze. Like I mentioned, labyrinths. Now, if you. Ah, I am thinking very quickly, faster than I can speak, just so you know. Uh, as you can tell, Everything moves in a circle, which goes against my falling down thing earlier, but you have to understand there's a shortcut in the middle. So the things that can't fall all the way down, they actually go in the middle into personalized nutrition, which makes you a weird sort of crazy Mr. Goodbody type guy, if you remember that. Was weird. Thank you, one person! Okay! And I would like to thank you all for uh, discussing whatever the topic was at the beginning of my speech. Have a good night. You can pick up your honorary PhDs in, in, in farm-related microbiotics uh, on the way out. Um, so I wanted to say, uh, at the beginning of the show, we had Andrew Michael and Chris Ledford up. Uh, they also have shows coming up, so this Friday, Go see Andrew Michael at uh, the Venti Brewery, is that correct? Um, at, and, and the third Friday at Wonder Root, that's, that's where the show is this Friday. And then Chris Ledford on Wednesday is going to be helping out with Scene Missing Magazine, which is doing a Star Wars themed show, so go and see that. Uh, up next, our last performer of the evening, I'm sorry to bid you adieu, is William Miracle, a comic who can be seen all over Atlanta. He runs the weekly open mic at the hangar on Thursdays, at 9 p.m. Please welcome the stage, William. Hey, y'all. Uh, so starfish are cool, huh? <laughs> I like starfish. I think starfish are cool. I like fish that are shaped like shapes. <laughs> I like making the name a living thing after a shape. <laughs> Is that why fish are called fish? Is it because they're shaped like fish? Uh, what I don't like is that starfish are dying every day. What is the cause? I the cause, right? No, but uh, I'm doing biology news, and I read that a bunch of starfish uh, have been dying as it's of this thing called starfish wasting disease syndrome. Uh, that's not the phrase, but basically they're, it's like, this epidemic, it's this real crisis because they're trying to figure out what it was. They just found out something called a Durso virus. And um, what I'm, I'm more concerned for uh, the horrified Christian child who's just, just alarmed about how many starfish are going to be in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> like, first the bees, now this? <laughs> 
Walter is terrified. Uh, <laughs> Moving on to the, the scariest thing I want to talk about tonight is uh, neg negliriasis. I'm not going to be able to pronounce too many words I want to talk about. But there is this, uh, you might have heard of this. It's been going on for a while, but we've had a few cases in the southeast this year also of this um, brain-eating amoeba you can get from water getting in your nose. It's pretty much it. Like, it's horrifying. 100% chance, like, not 100%, but like 95% chance of like immediately like, you're just gonna die. And it's horrifying, and it's scary, and could we like, call it something other than brain-eating <laughs> amoeba? Like, I don't know. Like, like, buddy skunk, I don't, anything. <laughs> That makes me think of like I don't know like a, like uh, that, that, that makes me think less of a microorganism eating my mind from the inside out until I die, uh, and more of like a, like a cool like a, like a sunglasses wearing skunk right <laughs> <laughs> and holding a skateboard. I prefer to I don't like there's I'm I'm all for science and discovery and knowing the most you can about the world, but isn't there something to be said? For being ignorant, like isn't there something? <laughs> like remember when people used to just die mysteriously? <laughs> like gonna look into it? No. <laughs> I don't wanna follow that trail. Um, <laughs> no, buddy's gonna follow. Along. That's what I thought. I uh, also learned this about this year. This happened. If you did not know, uh, we have found the largest. Dinosaur fossil. Give it up. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to give it up. That was a special trick. Um, it's called the Dreadnoughtus Shrani, and it's is this super huge, it's heavier than a 737. Uh, they call it the Dreadnought because it need not dread, like it was just in charge of everything. <laughs> And like I, I love, I love that we're finding all sorts of new and bigger dinosaurs, because I, 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 more specific dinosaurs, because as time goes on, di dinosaur fiction and films we grew up with will just get less and less impressive. They're just like, oh, these kids are running away from a T-Rex? Okay, it's not <laughs> the highest stakes. <laughs> this is a smaller scale movie. It's like an indie drum. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a small, low-budget indie drum. If it, it couldn't afford a dreadnought. Because uh, like we used to, we thought T Rex was on top for a while, and then, and then there was like Spinosaurus and a bunch of others, and there's this guy. This guy is like, it's like it's like T Rex is like a low level criminal now, and then this new guy is like the kingpin of dinosaurs. But then, audience, uh, who's who's the daredevil of dinosaurs? Who's who's the Jessica Jones of dinosaurs? What's Netflix like for dinosaurs? <laughs> what would dinosaurs think of the television show Dinosaurs? <laughs> Can an analog for racism be made? Should it be? <laughs> no. I can't think of an example of racism extending such a contrived... I can't think of a group wearing an animatronic suit of another group. <laughs> so I don't know how anyone would react, let alone a dinosaur. Y'all see Jurassic World? That happened this year, and it's related to dinosaurs, so I can talk about it. Uh, uh, it's interesting, you know, because they thought that that was like a new movie we all discovered, but it turns out it was just fossilized remains of the first movie. <laughs> With just a bunch of bones that were just like made of garbage. <laughs> it was crazy. Jimmy Buffett was in it though. Who's that? Although, I mean, if you're determined enough, couldn't you find Jimmy Buffett in anything? <laughs> Any parrot heads here tonight? Yep. Oh. <laughs> is, is that what they're. Is it puffin heads? <laughs> It's the biggest dinosaur in the this year, it's crazy. In addition to that, uh, this year the strongest organic material is found. Uh, limpet teeth. Y'all know limpet? It's their teeth. <laughs> uh, but you didn't see 
it reported like that. You didn't see like limpet teeth, new strongest material, organic material. No, it was it was always presented in the news like uh, limpet teeth beats spider silk in strength test. <laughs> Which first off, limpet teeth beats spider silk sounds like a result in the Battle of the Bands competition. <laughs> Like a, like the first round. <laughs> and then Limpet Teeth loses in the second round. I also, I just don't, I don't know, like, Limpet Teeth beats Spider Silk. Spider Silk got beaten by the Limpet Teeth. The shit kicked out of it. Now it's, it's the way it is. Now I, I don't like this, like, narrative of, like, <laughs> like, this, like, animosity. It's comp- why does that have to be a competition? Huh? I mean, why... I feel like, I feel like Spider Silk and Limit Teeth have every reason to be friends. <laughs> I mean, they're both super strong organic materials. Like, it's not like they have nothing in common. Like, I feel, I feel like, I feel like Spider Silk would like bump into Limpet Teeth on campus, you know? Like Limpet Teeth's a freshman, Spider Silk's a sophomore. And Spider Silk is sort of popular, but they, they like hit it off, but like, Spider Silk would be really intrigued by Limpet Teeth. And soon Spider Silk's calling Limpet Teeth at odd hours. They just spend nights picking each other's brains. And Spider Silk starts to really respect Limpet Teeth, begins to understand that there can be something stronger than itself that it can be invested in, that it can be spun around. <laughs> and one night they're playing video games in Spider Silk's dorm room and they're, they're laughing. And then they look at each other in that moment after laughter stops. And they're laughing. <laughs> they look at each other's faces. And then Limpet Teeth kisses Spider Silk. <laughs> but Spider Silk's embarrassed. And the night becomes awkward. They don't hang out quite as often. But they're in the same program, so they have to see each other. <laughs> and Spider Silk, Spider Silk hates it. Spider Silk wishes it had kissed Limpet Teeth back, but it's too late. It'll never have the chance again. And so Spider Silk becomes frustrated and upset whenever it sees Limpet Teeth. And soon, <laughs> Soon there's this TA position they're both in the running for. And it's like Spider Silk starts having these like sweating, horrific nightmares. The, the, the Limpet Teeth is, is going to get the position. And, and Limpet Teeth does. Limpet Teeth does get the position. Because Spider Silk knows that Limpet Teeth is stronger. Was always stronger. Was always going to be stronger. And Spider Silk just wishes it was strong enough. Liberty beats Spider Silk in a strength! It's just not for me. Thank you guys so much. Any dream I had when I was creating this show, it was for people to write sexy fan fiction about scientific discoveries. <laughs> I'll be in my bunk. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out of the show. Uh, that's it. That's all I got. As you can tell me on the newsletter, please sign up for it. If you would like to contribute in any way, you don't actually have to be scientifically factual. Just do something that touches like the naughty bits of science. That's all we want. Uh, send us an email at info at solvedrexshow.com. Please come out to our next show. Our next show in Atlanta is going to be during the Atlanta Science Festival, March 24th. Uh, our next show in general is going to be in the, the Miami Science Fiction Film Festival. Ooh, so if you guys want a road trip to Florida, come check us out. Uh, have, have a fun time over the holidays, and uh, be safe getting home, guys.